Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Build. Our next guest is a male country singer and an advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. As the first out mainstream male Nashville star, he has recently re-recorded his past hit, What Mattered Most, with brand new pronouns, and just recently released a brand new album called Got It Covered. Every way, Ty Herndon is here. Hello, hi everybody. Thank you. We have so much to talk about, but I do want to start with what mattered most, re-recording yeah. that song. You know, when you started thinking about wanting to, you know, quotes, fix pronouns in your music, why come back to this one? It was such a big hit for you. Was it just about setting it right, setting the record right? Well, you know, we just we just uh, just saw this great video of these kids. You know, I go out and, and I have the opportunity. It is my honor to go out and speak to a lot of kids um, around the country all the time. And for me, this was the 25th anniversary of this song. I started when I was 10, just so you guys know. 25th anniversary, I wanted to give it a birthday present, but I also wanted to do something, kind of put my money where my mouth was with these kids to go out and be brave enough to change a huge hit record that I had um, to how I would sing it today. And I didn't really think it would affect me like it did. I got in the studio, we recorded the track, I produced it, and I got in there to sing it uh, one afternoon, on a Friday afternoon, and I sang it through one time. We had we had to actually clear the studio. Right. Yeah, I, I became the crying cowboy. <laughs> no. That day I totally it did. It took a little bit it longer was, than you anticipated. It was a, like 25 years of this is the way that, that I need to sing this song. And the, and the most beautiful part about it was that, you know, there was some incredible songwriters that were that also gifted that song to me way back then, and they loved it. They absolutely did. And the fans have been great. I performed it uh, in front of about 10,000 people the other night. I started it out the original way. And in the second verse, I move into the, uh, the the new version of it, and they just came to their feet, that. man. And it was, uh, and I had crying cowboy again. It's, <laughs> it's pretty cool to keep both versions in your live set and sort of mash it together. Everybody yeah. gets the version that either was big for them when they were young, or that they sort of also wished had the pronouns they wanted. Well, listen, no, no matter how much I wanted to do that, when it comes to messing with a song that's an iconic song, right. even if it is yours, uh, people have you know. The thing about country music, the thing about music in general is we hear a song, we hear it on the radio, the TV, where we're listening to it, and it imprints our lives, some songs more than others, and we always remember them. So that, was, that song had a, had a lot of stories around that song. I never knew so many people's hair was long and their eyes were blue, <laughs> right. that they were, you know, broke up. That was a sad part. <laughs> Um, if you go to your Spotify page, there's actually a lot of new versions of this song on this album that you can listen to. It bookends yeah. the album. We've got the alternate version first. We've got another version last. We've got mixes. Yeah. You know, what was, it feels very celebratory of this song, saying it can go in all these different directions. It was super fun. Um, I always say this. Um, I, this album was my 20th album, so it's, uh, it's kind of great. Thank you. <laughs> kind of crazy to think that I've been doing music that long, but... Um, I kind of looked at these songs. They, they've been great to me. They were gifts to me. They, you know, all these songs were number one records. And to be able to, uh, to take them in the studio, I kind of said this. It's kind of like a great old house with bones. The house is great, but sometimes it just needs a new coat of paint. <laughs> so we put a new coat of paint on some of these songs and kind of did some modern sounds on them. And, and uh, just I love this record. We also had a lot of fun because I'm also singing this. I've got a lot of new young fans out there, and they're hearing these songs for the first time. So... Um, I had a guy the other night, he was a 15-year-old, and he walked up to me backstage. He goes, I heard the antique version of that one, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, you've got quotes saying the way that you would sing this in the 90s and still feel authentic as you would think about your parents' relationship or other relationships that were yes. important to you. Um, what kind of toll does that take over the course of many years of it not being able to be in your mind about you? You know, I had a great analogy about this today because I've, I've been I've had a lot of ups and downs in my career being in country music and having to uh, be closeted for so long. You know, that causes some pretty deep scars, uh, which are songs that I write about today. But, um, you know, way early on, you know, here I was uh, selling millions of albums and and sitting with my second number one billboard hit, you know, and, and suffering from a pretty pretty terrible drug addiction. I've been 17 years sober now. So also congratulations. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, I, the great thing about that is I remember the words. So it's, 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 it's <laughs> a little amazing. bit easier. But in the analogy I said there, that you, 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 you grow up and you really want to be this, you want to make music. And I grew up in the Christian and gospel and country and bluegrass community, you know, uh, kind of sat me down in the wrong spot there. But I just, my analogy was, you know, this, there's this 80 story skyscraper and that's your career and that's the music that you want to be in. And you're holding on by, a, by one finger up there and you're at the top of the building and you're at the top of the world, you can't hold on. The building's not gonna move, right. but your finger's gonna break. You're gonna come falling down. And then uh, uh, I just, you know, 
uh, I'm so fortunate to have learned those life lessons, and, and I'm able to talk to kids about that today. You don't have to take this path. You can go into anything that you want to in this life. You want to be a great songwriter, then I want you to study hard. And I want you to be the best songwriter you can be. If you want to be an actor, then study hard. Study your craft. And your sexuality doesn't really matter that much because you're taking your authenticity into your craft. And so it's so awesome to be able to, to pass on those life lessons to these amazing kids today. And, hey, I had an 89-year-old woman come out to me the other day. She's like, hey, we've been together 90 years. We just came out. Yes, but you're only 80. <laughs> How's that working? She was amazing, though. And uh, it, it just doesn't matter. You know, I think hearts need to be wide open. And one of the really big gifts that I get to do today, I also get to talk to parents. Right. Because my grandmother told me something a long time ago. You know, if, if we're going to have these kids and put them out on this planet, you got one job, people, and that's to love that child. Right. I mean, no matter what form, what shape, what color, what nationality. We had to love our kids. So that's kind of become the thing I talk about a lot today. It's just uh, about love and acceptance. I love that. Um, you know, I think that we did see, you're talking about the ups and the downs in your career. We saw a lot of those downs. I'm curious if now, as you've embraced this path as being an advocate and an ally and an educator, yeah. do you value that in a new way? Do you find that oh, that gosh. taught me I needed, I needed those lessons? You know, I also say this to the kids, you know, I don't know what path you're going to go down in this life. You're obviously going to have ups and downs and, and nothing's going to be perfect. But I always say this, um, you know, my finger did break on that building and I took a pretty hard tumble. You know, I, took, I fell down a long ways. Um, and um, for, for me, without those scars, I'm, I'm perfectly where I'm at today. It's the story I have to tell. I, and I get, get to write some pretty, pretty great songs about my journey. And, and, and most of them are full of joy today as well. So, um, but life, uh, you never know what, uh, as we say in country music, where that dirt road's going to take you. You know, and what's important is, um, Reba McIntyre told me this, is, you know, when you get into that dirt road, make sure you pave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a nice thing. Pave it as you're leaving, follow you. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, you know, outside of your own music, do you feel like young kids now, if they are looking at country music, you've said recently, and it kind of hurt my heart a little bit, saying that there's a lot of people in the LGBT community who thought, yes. I like country music, I want to like it, but I'm not sure it likes me. Do you feel I hear like that from changing? I hear that from that from so many kids because there's so many kids, especially in the South, that want to be in music, and I and when I go and talk to a kid, it breaks my heart too to hear this super talented kid go. You know, I'm super afraid to come to Nashville. I'm super afraid that uh, to love a genre of music that doesn't love me, and and it's so great to be able to sit them down and just say, and you know take a hand and go. That's not true anymore. Once again, work work your butt off, be the best singer songwriter that you can be and come to town. You have friends there. So we are, we are a loving family. Things are changing. Um, and I love that. You know, we've got a, some great LGBTQ artists that are coming up the pike out there that I, that I know we're going to hear all over the radio. So, you know, and that's not just country music. That's just music. That's just life. You know, we, uh, um, as an LGBT person, I like to say this, um, sometimes I like to walk away from that label because I'm just a guy making music, you know, I'm just, I'm actually a country boy from Alabama, you know, and I grew up on a farm. So, uh, I just, I like these kids to know that, um, that, um, that we love them and that's, that's just all there's to it. Yeah. I'm curious, is the real sign of success in the future when we're not talking about this in terms of the storyline at all, when it's just... Ty has an album, and here are the songs that are on it. Absolutely, yeah. And then, you know, the, the real storyline is when I kiss my husband at the end of it. That's going to be amazing. <laughs> okay. um, it's interesting because I think that you did say also, for most of the time, you were out to your bandmates and some people yeah. very close to you. So was mainly the fear that the audience would abandon me, or was it that the community of artists would be unwelcoming? You know, my, my dear friend Shelly Wright came out, uh, a, a, an amazing activist and singer-songwriter. She had a bunch of number one records in country. She came out about eight years ago, and it was, it was super hard for her. I, I just think, to answer that question, um, now is a better time because people are more educated. And, you know, you, in my small town of Butler, Alabama, you know, there's, uh, uh, there, there's a, a dentist that's there and that he and his husband live there. And, so, and the, the community really welcomes them. So I think really the key... Part of all of this is just is just educating people that um, um, we are we are uh, we're we're here we're queer. What does it say? We're here. We're queer. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> yes. I love it. Um, we just watched the music video for So Small. Um, there are some very special children in it. The Rainbow uh, Squad Kids. Yes. I'm curious if you can explain what that organization is, how you came into contact with them. I was sitting at home. Um, I usually get home off the road on, on Sundays, and I was sitting watching watching TV. And uh, actually, it was Monday morning, 
And um, uh, on the, the local news, there's this group of kids that wanted to be in the Pride Parade in Nashville, Tennessee, but they didn't have a, they didn't have a trailer, they didn't have a float. So this was the news report, these amazing LGBTQ plus kids uh, were looking for someone to donate them um, uh, a farm truck or a trailer. I think they had like, like something like 30 trailers, right immediately people were, and so I, I just thought it was cool. It made an imprint on my brain, just seeing the kids, see them happy, smiling. Um, and then I was the Grand Marshal for the Nashville Pride Parade this last year, and um, uh, this, this super big storm came through and delayed the whole thing. They had to clear the streets. And, you know, I was only thinking about one thing. These poor kids, <laughs> they worked so hard on this float. Well, the clouds parted, the parade happened, and I saw these amazing kids on their float. Um, I was also playing Cincinnati Pride that night, so guess what? One of the Grand Marshals had to exit the weather, so there was, an, there was a drag queen in my, in my, chair, in my, in my seat, so... I'm sure that started some rumors in Asheville, but um, I saw these kids again on the float, just super happy, just smiles, and I thought to myself, I want to do something special with them, and I did a little research um, and found out they're, they're a group of 19 to 25 kids that are all 15 year old and under, and the cool thing about it is they form this community. Now, what does community bring? Community brings support and love. So... That's, I was like, okay, these kids all hang out. You know, they're from, from East Nashville, and um, they're just amazing. And I got in touch with one of the moms. I said, I, would it be okay? I, I need uh, maybe maybe five or six of these kids. She goes, you can't use five or six. You have to use all it's of them. It's an all or nothing deal. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, how many are there? <laughs> she said, well, let me, let me call you back. She called me back. She goes, they'll be 19. I said, great. We'll call Subway, make sure they're fed. We doubled the face paint order. <laughs> we, doubled the, we doubled the order, and the kids all showed up. The face painter was there. They had a blast. They got to choose what they wanted their face to say, and they, as they called it, their war paint. And let me tell you guys, hanging out with 19, uh, 15-year-olds down to 10-year-old kids, um, they will school you. <laughs> they will school you in a New York second. So I learned not only a lot about them, I learned a lot about myself. Yep, so. <laughs> we should also talk about why you covered so small to begin with. It is yes. a Carrie Underwood original recording. Um, I think you have a pretty personal connection to when you heard it at an interesting time in your life when you were thinking maybe I should be doing something else with my career. I did. You know, I got back, uh, it was not soon after uh, I had uh, been through rehab. And I got home and I was just kind of running around Nashville. I, I was just kind of wondering if my voice could still be heard, if anyone wanted to hear it, actually. Um, and I was okay. I, I was really, I was well in my soul. Um, and I actually had signed up for this really expensive real estate class. Uh, and I was, let me tell you, I was broke. I was just as broke. So I borrowed the money for this, from, this, uh, from a good friend of mine. And uh, I was sitting in the parking lot because I felt like country music had changed so much. There wasn't really a lot of music that really mattered. And, and, and please, uh, artists, if you're watching today, don't take that wrongly. They're just, it was more party music, you know, uh, just uh, kind of dirt country kind of stuff. And that just wasn't what I did. And... Um, um, I heard Carrie Underwood so small on the radio. It was 2007, I believe. And uh, man, you know, um, uh, crying cowboy again. <laughs> I was sitting in my truck, and I and I uh, I said, "That's the kind of music I want to make." And 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 this incredible singer, and she's she is so gifted, an incredible singer. But she was she was singing about something that was going to change people's hearts and minds. And um, I didn't go to the class. I didn't, and I eventually played, paid the debt back, just so you know. So I was going to say, yeah. you might have had a very upset friend. Yeah, I, I should have walked in the bill and said, somebody can have my, my space. But uh, I did do the class, and I started working really hard. It was another four years, right. another four, almost five years. Um, and the next album after that, I won a Dove Award and Grammy nomination for uh, the, my, my, the start of my authentic, authentic journey. My authenticity was shining really, really good. Did you ever send the finished product of this cover to her? Do you know if she's heard it or have you heard back? She sent, you know, I, I wouldn't do it personally. I, d I do know her. She's a really, really amazing lady. But uh, I didn't want to feel like, because uh, on this album, I also have a Bonnie Raitt song. I have, I've covered a Mark Cohen song. And, and those guys are, are, are some of my heroes as well. Um, but I, I never sent it to any of them. And um, just out of the blue, I got an amazing tweet okay. from Carrie. And she said the most beautiful thing. She said, you know, we... We, we record these songs and we write these songs in hopes that they come out there into the world and, they, and they're heard and, and, um, 
and that they make a difference, something like that. And she said, but when another artist <laughs> hears your song, it, it means so much to them that they also want to record it. It really becomes a special thing. So I got a big heart, and I love this album. So it was super sweet of her. And uh, when I see her, I'll give her a big hug and say thank you. Um, the other covers that you just mentioned are I Can't Make You Love Me and obviously Walking in Memphis. What were you using to guide yourself to pick <laughs> these songs? I mean, they're not necessarily ones you would all line up next to each other. Well, I started out, I just wanted to kind of give a facelift to all of my hits. And then I realized that, um, uh, you know, I'm kind of bored with me. <laughs> I got my record deal singing in cover bands in Texas. I won Texas Entertainer of the Year like in 1994. And um, I've just always added great songs to my show because I enjoy singing them. So these were some songs that, that meant a lot to me. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Bonnie Raitt song, I Can't Make You Love Me. But if you are familiar with it, then I, I feel quite certain you've been at somewhere in your point of your life where someone's broken your heart. And that song has come on and you just, uh, you know, you fall into a million pieces. And that's, that's the sign of a great song. And then hopefully some Sheryl Crow comes on after that. And all I want to do is have some fun. And it lifts you back up. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was in a relationship but in the heart of, of all of my craziness for a long time. And that relationship just ended because I couldn't come out. And so and I heard that song. I've had a lot of personal moments in my truck, you guys. <laughs> that song came on uh, the radio. And I had to pull my truck over. And it forever was imprinted on my heart. And then... Um, that Mark Cohen album is, is also an imprint. I love every song on that. And I, uh, I think Cher also cut Walking in Memphis. The, the difference is Cher made him $2 million, and I feel quite sure I'm going to make him two bucks. So, <laughs> It's all positive, though. It's not it's all detracting. Positive. It works. Absolutely. <laughs> um, is the plan to continue on and go through sort of your whole catalog and re-record and find new life for these songs in the next journey? Well, there, there are. Um, there's about... 15 more songs that I could do that with, and we'll see. I've got a jazz classic album coming okay. later. I'm all We're over the place. We're going to have to talk about that. My record label told me I could do what I want to do, and I think they're really sorry yeah. about that. But uh, we're getting into some orchestra work this next year, so um, I wanted to do some some of the classics with that. And then uh, in the new year, there's a, a brand-new original album coming for me that's going to be different than anything you've heard. So, Is it all new songs that all you're new writing? Songs, yeah. Are you surprised? I'm not going to make you talk too much about it. Are you surprised in any way about what you're writing about? Are you gravitating towards any theme? It shocked me, really? quite honestly, some of the things that are coming out of me right now. Yes. And uh, some, some are as heartbreaking as Bonnie Raitt and some are as, as uh, celebratory as Walking to Memphis. Um, but creating a new sound after you've done records this long, because this will be you know, in the upwards of, of, I don't know, 21 records over the, um, some have been obscure projects that you will never hear, but this particular record is, is uh, I've never really felt pressure about an album, and I, I, I won't start that now. I just feel very motivated okay. to create something really special um, with, uh, with that album that's coming. I love that. Um, it's a great tease. That is actually all the time there is for me, <laughs> but there are some people out here who have been waiting to ask questions. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, as a musical artist, uh, what other than music inspires you, whether it's visual art or just maybe even like politics or anything like that? Absolutely. Um, definitely not politics, because I have to keep my mouth shut about that. <laughs> yeah. But um, um, You actually I, don't. You have a microphone, I, I right? do. I do. Well, that's another show. We'll, we'll sit down and talk about that. But to answer your question, though, I love art. Um, I'm actually a bit of a painter. At uh, my, my fan club parties, uh, quite a few years, I would I would paint, and we would uh, sell those for charity. So very inspired by by art. And um, and I, this is a, a weird answer, but I've gotten some of my best song ideas when I'm uh, when I'm when I'm camping. <laughs> yeah, and we don't do glamping, y'all. It's really it's camping, just so you know. <laughs> Has nature always been a big thing for you? Yeah, I grew up in the country. You know, I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. It just we were always um, always outside, and so um, love love all the uh, uh, all the sports and stuff we do outside. I love that. And then there's one more question hiding here. Hi, um, thanks for coming to talk to us today. We have a question from our website buildseries.com. Sure. Um, a lot of your songs mean a lot to people, and they resonate with moments in their life. What's a song that um, resonated with you early on? Oh my gosh, that is a great question. Um, I would have to say probably there is a, it's, I, I love these serendipitous moments. There's a song that I recorded called I Know How the River Feels. And my good friend's Diamond Rio went later, uh, had a hit with it as, as well. Uh, I never released it as a single because it was so personal. 
uh, because I always and th- and just so you know, I was sitting in the green room and these guys were playing. I know how the river feels, and we have not talked about this. So, just so you know, and and ask uh, my agent was like, "Where are you going?" I said, "They're playing." I know how the river feels. So I actually got up out of my dressing room and walked out, and it actually was the song. But that song for me um, um, just represented when I recorded it. It was so personal because it just talks about. Um, not being able to uh, uh, to have your dreams for me it represented uh, hiding, and I know I just want to. I just sometimes want to get lost and 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 float down the river and and not be found. And so there was so much pain around that song for me. That's why I didn't release it as a single back then because I didn't want to talk about that. I knew I would get asked about it. So, um, but on the flip side of that, I, I had a, a huge hit record with a song called "Living in a Moment." And man, it is still it's still my mantra because I, I never get to finish the song because the crowd always ends up singing it so loud that I just put the microphone down and they sing it to me. So great moment in music. <laughs> You're welcome. That's awesome. Well, Ty, thank you for being here. You guys got it covered is out now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 